Please welcome to the stage political strategist Kellyanne Conway. And here to lead the conversation is Atlantic staff writer Tim Albert. Good morning. Welcome to my festival. We've <laughs> batting lead off here. Um, I hope we don't screw it up for everyone else. Kellyanne, it's a lot of pressure. Let's do it. Are you up to it? Good morning, okay. everyone. So Kellyanne Conway, for those of you who don't know, long before she became the first woman to uh, be campaign manager to a winning presidential campaign, before she became senior counselor to the president of the United States, Kellyanne was known to most of us as a pollster, as a Republican pollster. And pollsters, in my experience, really love softball questions. <laughs> so I'm going to kick off the 2024 Atlantic Festival with a softball question for you, Kellyanne. If the election were held today, who wins? <laughs> That's so easy. Um, if the election were held today, I think President Trump would win because he has an advantage in the seven swing states right now over Vice President Harris, and particularly in the swing states that get him a couple different paths to 270, which is the magic number. I think Vice President Harris, for the last two months, months plus, has been winning back a lot of the core Democratic constituencies that were elusive to President Biden at the top of the ticket. So she is doing much better than he was among young people, among women, among men and women in the suburbs, a little bit more among um, African Americans, basically the same among Hispanics. So she's an union household. So she's starting to get and, and continues to solidify what you would think of as the typical take for the Democratic presidential nominee. The question here on out is, um, what will the travel schedule look like in those swing states for each of them? It is the seven swing states. I totally agree with everybody's assessment that it's North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada. What's interesting about that, Tim, is that um, there are states that President Obama carried twice in 08 and 12, well over 50% of the vote, Florida, Ohio, Iowa, firmly in the Trump camp, aren't even swing states anymore. On the other side of the ledger, there are new swing states, like Arizona and Georgia, which were not thought of as swing states until very recently. So even for those of us who do this for a living, <clears throat> there's been a jumbling of the electoral map. But I would remind us all, we already know this, but to hear the stats really puts it into sharp relief. So tw 2016, President Trump wins uh, with 77,000 votes across Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. 77,744. There you go. Who's counting? <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and then in, in 2020, of course, President Biden, 44,000 votes, and the swing state in common is Wisconsin, but then you have Georgia and Arizona added to that. Why is this relevant? In 2020, ladies and gentlemen, we had 155,500,000 votes, a 10% increase from four years earlier, a huge uptick in, huge explosion in early voting and mail-in balloting because we had more people voting over more time in more ways than ever before, given we were in the middle of a pandemic and the polls are being opened up in very different ways. You can, you can do it by mail, you can do it on the Dropbox, et cetera, in person. Other people can do the ballot for you, which is what I was doing for my mom at the time, for example. So it's- you um, were harvesting? It was, very, it was legal in New Jersey. Okay, um, okay. Yes, uh, but anyway, uh, well, she harvested me, so I, I figured I'd harvest the oh, ballot. Anyhow, um, so that was a very unusual election. What we're seeing right now is I think so much of this is going to be the same, meaning a tactical trench warfare technical election, which is who has the better ground game, who has the better get out the vote program, not just enraging voters, but engaging them and getting them to the polls. And so the noisiest people right now, whether they want to talk about a rally or a debate or the candidates or a TV appearance, the noisiest people right now are already decided. The 5% who remain are very fascinating to me. They don't look like the rest of the electorate. They told the New York Times Siena College pollsters in that explosive poll that came out two days before the debate, Tim, that 0% um, of them said they're going to vote on character. 2% of them said abortion was the top issue. That's very different than the electorate overall. But if you're a character or abortion immigration voter, you're all set. So it's that 5%. Who, and they are dug in. Here's the question about them, and this is why I think is decisive in this election. 
The second question for the undecided voters is, for whom to vote, Harris or Trump? The first question is whether to bother at all. And for some of them, I think they will be conscientious objectors. I mean, the idea, my two grandmothers were born before women had the right to vote. The idea that their combined six daughters would never have voted, and they would have admitted that to you, they would have felt ashamed to say, I'm not voting, after their mothers couldn't do it until much later in their lives. They would have felt ashamed growing up in the 60s, 70s, uh, to not do that. And yet now, people use it as a badge of courage. I don't like either, oh, I'm not going to encourage this. My vote doesn't count. I'm not, I, 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 don't, I don't feel included. Is, is your sense that after this explosive jump in raw turnout that we saw in, from, from 16 to 20, that we will see a drop off from 20 to 24? Maybe, although the enthusiasm is there on both sides, certainly. You know, Kamala Harris does have a new energy and enthusiasm, certainly, in, in base and base plus. And Trump's is not just base. If it were just base, he wouldn't be competitive. It's base plus. It's his ability, I think, to expand demographically and geographically his reach um, into voter blocks that did not support him in 2016 or 2020 and typically would either vote for a Democrat or not at all. Um, President Trump's best last mile of wire, if you will, will be among the voters this time who say they're likely to vote but did not vote in 2020. So he does very well with them. The big question is how do you get them to vote? If they weren't presidential voters in the highest turnout we've ever had, how do you get them to vote? And I think what's fascinating to me is that the current incumbent, Vice President Harris, wants to run as the new face, you know, fresh face, um, insurgent, non-incumbent change maker. And President Trump is running as the insurgent with an incumbent's record. He wants everybody to remember what it was like when he was off in office, particularly when it comes to no new wars and the economy, particularly 2019. She wants to sort of start from here and say, this is my vision moving forward. So it's a fascinating construct. So the one thing that both campaigns agree on is that we are sort of, you use the phrase trench warfare, that we are sort of back to where we began in many ways. If this was a campaign in three phases, the first, campaign, the first phase was 18 months ago, where both the Biden and Trump world looked at this as sort of a coin flip, and they were going to be fighting over about 150,000 voters across 15 yeah. counties or so. And then we entered phase two, where Biden declined sharply, and Trump rose accordingly, and then they pushed him out of the race, and now we're in phase three, which both campaigns think we're sort of back to the trench warfare phase. I want to talk about that in just a minute. Before we do, we've had some seismic events. We thought 2016 was the craziest election of our lifetimes. Is my mic on? It is. No? Hello? Oh, there we are. Okay. We thought 2016 was the craziest election of our lifetimes with Access Hollywood and Comey and Clinton investigation, and then 20 with COVID, but already in this cycle, We've had the president of the United States pushed out by his party. We've had an assassination attempt on the president, potentially two assassination attempts on the president. And more to come, potentially, in these next 50 days, uh, who knows what's in store. But another big moment is this debate a couple of weeks ago. And I have to ask you, who do you blame more for that performance, Donald Trump or the people who prepared him? You're assuming that the country absorbs that debate the way you do, or the way anybody well, in this room would. Metrics show that most of the country did. Well, I think that um, it was a high-risk, high-reward prospect for Vice President Harris more than President Trump because it was his seventh or ninth presidential debate. We haven't heard much from her, so I think it was a very big moment for her. Um, and she met the moment in many ways. Um, obviously, she said things that have since been fact-checked. I think she was fact-checked in real time by our troops who are serving honorably, God bless them, um, abroad and other things. But um, I think for President Trump, he should look at it as part of his batting average. In other words, it goes into the whole factory of appearances for him. He is on long-form podcasts. He does rallies a couple times a week. He goes on television shows. He did that just yesterday. Uh, uh, everything I just said, he did yesterday. Um, and he should look at it as part of his batting average. I think taking too much time to respond to what she was saying, uh, I think that was very um, maybe alarming and, and off-putting, which is, wow, you're bringing up all the greatest hits. Like, we have cable news for this. Um, mm -hmm. We thought it was going to be a conversation about vision. But I, I would say this. Hi. Oh, thank you. Hello. Oh, sorry about that. I won't sing. Actually, OK. Um, so this is what I would say. For um, the polls haven't budged that much. Some have, but in the swing states, they really haven't. The underlying fundamentals are the same, and I think it is because of that. And I think for Vice President Harris, 
she's had a big moment every month since she's gotten in. So July, she becomes a nominee, big moment. August, she has a convention, big moment. September, she had a debate. These things are won or lost on what you do in between those big moments. I personally think we need another debate, A, because I'm a big fan of democracy, and I love the fact that people have an opportunity to see the candidates shoulder to shoulder, um, responding to each other, responding to the moderator's questions, and taking an opportunity, even when not asked, to either review their record, contrast with the other person, and give us that vision thing. Um, people in this country are suffering. There's no question about it. But Donald, uh, Donald Trump did not seem keen to have another debate. Now, you talk with him frequently. Have you told him that you broke him to debate again? I did tell him that. And what does he I say? Said, he said, oh, you're in the minority. I said, well, I'm not in the minority of people who tell you what you need to know and not what you want to hear, um, <laughs> which would put me in the majority. Mm. And I'm not thinking of anybody in particular except that he said, you know, I put out my truth social, Kelly. And he said, I, you know, when you're a boxer, when the boxer wins the fight, you don't need another one. And I said, but it's not that simple. You want the other opportunity because the first debate, you know, it was told anyone, anytime, any, any time, anywhere, I think. And the any time ended up being June 27th, which is so super early. It's before the two conventions. And had the first debate been September 10th against Joe Biden, I think he, you'd be stuck with him as the nominee, certainly. It'd be a very different ball game. So the first one happened super early changed the dynamic completely. President Trump has said that publicly. He has yes. said, I think I knocked him out too early. He's very unhappy about it. Well, I don't know about that. I'm not going to characterize oh. his mood or his, uh, he, he does that for us, so I don't need to do that for him. But, um, and then the second one, if you agree to have ABC and its moderators, then you are potentially walking into a network which unbiased reporting says is 84% negative towards him and about 85% positive towards her. Those are just the facts. Now, you can work around that. You can say, gee, you just said young people care most about climate change. I don't know, I'm looking at the stats and a lot of them care about, 23% told pollsters last week, they don't think they'll have children because they like their financial freedom and it's too expensive. They can't add somebody to the, to the household payroll, a kid, a spouse. Um, they care about that too. They care about many things. Let's stop slicing and dicing everybody into being go, monolithic go, voters. Go back to something you said a minute ago about the people who tell him what he wants to hear versus what he needs to hear. Because needs I have, to know, needs to needs know. Needs to know, right. Because I have one more debate question. Why was Laura Loomer on his plane heading to that debate? I, I, I prefer Laura Trump. That's my, that would be my favorite Laura to be around him. She's doing a great job at the RNC. Um, I don't know, and I'm not here to criticize his campaign team. I don't do that. What I'm, what I'm here to say is that uh, I, I think that any one moment, like our shock absorbers are so thick in this country now for so many reasons. You just mentioned a bunch of them. They've only really happened in the last 70 days, 80 yeah. days. Tim, I think our shock absorbers are so thick that there's no one moment or incident that people say, aha. And lots of folks, in fairness, have, and people that we both know very well. Well, and you said, ran a campaign, Kellyanne. Yeah, but for we have, you know what? Would you, would you have let Laura Loomer on the panel? No. Because, um, because people, I don't know her. I don't know that I've ever been in the same room with her. Um, I, people have shown me what she has said. I'm not a big fan of Twitter. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, I, I just don't live on social media. I'm not willing to live online. I'm willing to live offline with all of you here. It just tastes, looks, smells, and is better. Um, but so I don't, I don't know this person. I know, um, so when I learned more about her and what she was saying, including to my 19-year-old daughter, it's unacceptable. And I've pushed back on that. And I've had a conversation or two with the president since that I won't reveal. Um, and I like what I heard. I will just say that. And I don't really care what she says. I don't care what people screaming on social media say. It doesn't really matter. It matters to me if they're anti this or anti that. And I know that they don't reflect the principle. Um, I, you know, so, no, she if, wouldn't have been there. If, in fact, she doesn't reflect the principle. If we're sure. If she that. doesn't. Uh, the things I've seen, um, I, I don't understand why people feel the need to um, scream and complain and bellyache online as much as everybody seems to be, seems to do. And can I just say something else about that? We are allowed in this country. I think I'm just old, if not old fashioned. I, 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 we're allowed in this country to have an unexpressed thought. <laughs> we're allowed. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that's why most of what I do and most of my conversations are private. Certainly, what I do for my clients. But I, I think the president. I think President Trump. Um, sees this election as 
the trench warfare technical election, but also one of ideas. And that's why if you ask him about that debate, he'll tell you, I said, well, you're going to do all these great things. You've had three and a half years. In fact, you're there right now. She can get on Air Force. We know she's there because she flies, she's Vice President Howard. She flies around on Air Force Two. And just trying to distance herself from all of that, I don't think is great policy or great politics. But um, you know, him saying to her about Afghanistan and um, the economy and the Green New Deal, I think he got plenty in there. Here's what I want to know about this trench warfare campaign, if in fact that that's what President Trump believes. It's certainly what his campaign folks believe. This campaign, as I have documented in my own published reporting, has intentionally diverted millions and millions and millions of dollars away from a field program, a traditional ground game, in these key battleground states, in these key counties that we've been discussing, and diverted that money toward this very sort of amorphous election integrity program. And when I talk to people inside of the campaign, they're frustrated, they're exasperated, and they're not entirely sure what that money is going to do when, at the same time, people on the ground in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Georgia are calling Trump HQ on a daily basis, reading the Riot Act, saying we have no manpower, no resources on the ground here. So if, in fact, this is a trench warfare campaign, why on earth have they made this decision to effectively abandon much of the ground game in the pursuit of this election integrity program? You're characterizing it in a way I don't think they would. And if people in the campaign are talking to you respectfully instead of other people in the campaign, they should not be on the campaign. Um, you got to tell the folks you're working with first and foremost. Well, I think they have in many cases. Well, maybe. I mean, I see a little too many stories these days, uh, of course, anonymously sourced always, that uh, the campaign is poised to win and is disciplined, but the candidate's not. So maybe that's coming from the same people that are talking to you. They shouldn't be saying that. They should be too busy to do that. Uh, but look, this is what I would say, that there's a lot more money this time. I mean, we had no money, and I would say necessity was a mother of invention. I think the best Trump is the 2016 Trump hunger, swagger, underdog, underestimated, 50% television ads, 50% digital ads, but overlaid with the money he has now in 2024, which is significant, and the four-year presidential record. So I think in those ways that Trump 2024 can be the best Trump candidacy of all. And I know Susie Wiles and other people in the campaign, they're doing a fabulous job trying to meet the moment of 2024, meaning here's what the principal, here's who our principal is. He wants to go out and do those rallies. He wants to do the long form podcast. He wants to meet with the people. He wants to do these policy videos back at Mar-a-Lago or Bemister and put them out. He wants to be on social media. <clears throat> but they also are meeting the moment of how many people are getting their primary sources of news and information through social media and digital. And that is not something, we took a chance in 2016 because we didn't have any money, it paid off. Um, Google and Facebook will tell you that there were weeks and days where the Trump campaign was the number one buyer of those ads over Hillary Clinton's campaign because she had so much money they were doing TV ads. Now, 2020, I'm very critical of the 2020 campaign. I wrote about it in my memoir, Here's the Deal. Simon & Schuster is putting it out in paperback soon, right ahead of this election. Um, have Save fun. the book plugs for the end. Yeah. Okay, let's... You, you, want, you want this book because a lot ended up being true. But I talk about how to win. But in 2020, the Trump campaign spent $1.6 billion. And I feel that they did prove many times that the fastest way to make a small fortune is to have a very large one and waste most of it. All these TV ads, an $11.5 million ad during the Super Bowl. What? You want that money at the end to yes. run the ads in Wisconsin and Michigan for whatever else, a civil unrest, George Floyd's murder, a, a, a global pandemic, I got it. But to be clear, I'm talking <laughs> with a Republican operative in Michigan running a very con competitive congressional race. And this time, two years ago in that district, they had 20 paid people on the ground between the RNC, the Michigan Republican Party. But there Party. are outside groups doing that now. You've got America First Work. You have Turning Point. They've got money. People who have and I, no, I will track say this about of, the RNC. no track record of running an effective ground game. I will, I, will, I will say this about Charlie the RNC. Charlie Kirk has never turned out a vote that they we're aware have, of. I don't know that that's true. I think you're just you know, not being nice. He's, he's built an empire there, um, not just with young people now. He but promised to deliver actually, all four statewide races in Arizona in 2022, and they lost all four statewide races. I'll let him speak for himself and what they're doing this time, but here's, here are the metrics that I've seen. I don't seen. think he's coming to the Atlantic. Here the, oh, I do. <laughs> I show up. I wish you, um, I wish you would. Uh, but I, I will say this. I think that I, I have seen all the metrics, and many of them are public. 
just the num learning how to invest in what I call now the non-sexy parts of politics. So not the exciting ads and not the candidate shaking your hand and signing a hat or showing up to, to a festival like this, but actually doing the work you need to do to make sure that the people feel engaged and included and seen and heard and that you become a resource. It's so easy to be a rebel. You have to be a resource to these voters. And I do know America First Work and Turning Point and many other groups. RNC, Laura Trump talks about this um, often. The, the numbers, that the, the voter rolls that have been cleaned, the, some of the uh, decisions that have come down, for example, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court came out with this decision last week, you have to have a return address or we're not gonna count your ballot, that is new. And I'm just telling you though, that, that anecdote I was sharing a minute ago. And why isn't she way ahead? I mean, back to my point, I think the fundamentals still favor him. She certainly can win, there's no doubt. It's gonna be a tight, I think it's a tight election. But then everything you're saying, the fundamentals should absolutely favor her because the Democrats have a complete machine when it comes to the turnout. And she's doing better politically. Well, it's often hard to tell until groups. election day how many That's points that, that machine is worth. Sure, right? So in the state of Wisconsin, thing. which has probably the best state party on the Democratic side in the country, their ground game has traditionally been worth two and a half, three points, maybe even three, three and a half points. And if the Trump people in those states, the county chairs, if they're complaining that they have no resources and that they're totally outgunned on the ground, and if this is trench warfare, you know, coming down to another margin of 20,000 votes in Wisconsin, 60, 70,000 votes in Pennsylvania, I mean, that really matters to, to not have the sort of robust ground game that they had in previous cycles. So is that concerning to you? Well, I can tell you what we did in 2016. Those groups, those parties got what we had. And we didn't have many resources, nothing compared to what they have now or even in 2020. But that's more important in many ways than running television ads. Why? Because roughly one in two households in this country right now, Tim, have a traditional subscription, television subscription service. People are streaming, they're, they're giving up their cable TV or, or they, have, they have Apple TV or they have something else, they have some other way of seeing it. Even if they watch cable stations like Fox News or CNN, they're doing, it on, they're doing it on their phones. Why do I say this? I say this because it's even lower in the seven swing states, the traditional television yeah. package. So I know that consultants get a 15 and 20 percent uh, commission on television ads, but the question is how many eyeballs are seeing that? In a long, so wrong line of work. I think that, right, aren't we in the wrong line of work? This is true. But I say this just because you got to meet people where they are. Politics 101 is we don't tell people what's important to them, they tell us, and we meet them where they are. And I think in 2020, the Democrats did a much better job of that. But 2024, the Republicans are spending an awful lot of time catching up. Now, you talk about election integrity. President Trump has told, he said it publicly, and he has said it privately, I'll turn out the vote, you go and protect it. And that, that, is, that, that is what he's talking about. He wants to make sure that people feel comfortable to vote. The best thing he can do at this point is to continue to tell people, vote when you wanna vote. If you wanna vote early in your state, do that. We already have early voting going on in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was our reach state in 2016. I would go on shows like Morning Joe and say, Pennsylvania is our reach state. They'd say, oh, isn't it the, the girl that got away, Republican fool's gold, they said it has been, but we see that the messages that are working in states that President Obama carried twice, like Ohio and Iowa, are working in Western Pennsylvania, other areas. We're going to lose the collar counties around Philadelphia, but not as badly as Romney did. So you want to mitigate right. the natural deficits, not eliminate them, you mitigate them, and then you run up the totals. That Pennsylvania doesn't exist anymore because they just started voting early. Yes. There was really very little early vote, certainly absentee vote, but there's very little early voting in Pennsylvania. So I think that they've even changed the entire way that they approach those states, and I give them credit for doing and that. Politics 101 is also, you say this a lot, that politics is addition, not subtraction. Sure. Um, I'm just curious here. Does J.D. Vance add a single voter to the Trump coalition who was not already going to vote for Donald Trump? Do you think there is one voter in America who, when he was added to the ticket, said, oh, I wasn't sure before, but now I'm voting Trump? Yes. You do? I do. Okay. I do think so. And I think we're going to see a very spirited debate between Tim Walls and J.D. Vance. And J.D. Vance is a Yale law school educated debater. If you go back and you pull his debate against Tim Ryan, Congressman Tim Ryan, when they ran against each other, United States Senate in Ohio less than two years ago. J.D. Vance was excellent, and Tim Ryan, I think, was the best Democratic um, Senate candidate in 2022. That's my opinion. He was um, formidable. You know, it's a great story. I think at that point, 
he had ran he run he ran against Nancy Pelosi for Speaker of the House. People forget mm -hmm. in 2017, right after Trump won, thinking that the party should learn its lesson and try to go back to being the party, the worker. Uh, that didn't work. It didn't work for him. It didn't work for the party. But he's a great debater. And J.D. Vance, if you go back and look, it was an excellent debate. So I think Tim Walls and J.D. Vance. That's going to move. Here's the other thing I'll say about J.D. Vance, and I've said it to him. I didn't know him well at all, and um, I think if he does. If he goes in and keeps talking about things like school choice, where there really is a, a bright line distinction between the two parties, um, I am very committed to an issue like that because I feel, unlike my children who are privileged and go to private schools of our choosing that we can pay for, um, just like the Obama girls and the Clinton door, you know, um, the I, just like they did. I think if you can do that, that's wonderful. But I really worry, Tim, that we have more and more kids with lost learning in schools that don't serve them well, and that they should have their parents should have other choices. And I say this because I think J.D. Vance can say from Middletown, Ohio, all the way to Yale Law School, I want other kids to have that opportunity. I feel like he should go into issues like that, talk about the forgotten man, forgotten woman. Here's the thing about J.D. Vance. So more school choice, less childless cat ladies. No. Well, would be, again, would I don't. I don't say. But again, you're. That's all baked in now, and we have a tied race with Trump slightly ahead in these swing states. Well, uh, so again, you got that. everybody can keep talking about that. No, no, no. Well, and, and we actually, keep showing Kamala Harris though, banning fracking, reimagining public yes. safety, and then pretending she's not for those things. We have no combat troops. In other words, oh, she's ripe for those attacks. For one, sure. well, but those are substantive things that a sitting vice president is saying she's changed her mind on. And I think if people just, instead of saying we're better off four years ago, that's not the construct, because four years ago this country was hurting. Five years ago, do you want Trump 2019, when we had the highest wage um, per household in, in modern American history, low interest rates, low unemployment, high consumer confidence, high confidence among small business owners, a more secure border, no foreign wars, Soleimani, El Baghdadi, gone, gone. In other words, all these things, a president that kept the promise of seven presidents, Republican and Democrat, to move that embassy to Jerusalem and to recognize it as the capital of Israel, and on and on and on. I say this because you compare that to Harris 2019 when she was out running her own campaign from scratch. Then it's destroying private health care. It's Green New Deal stuff. It's banning fracking. It's reimagining and public safety. And, and J.D. Vance, not far before that, was calling him America's Hitler. But we know so all people that. are changing no, listen, over, we, and over we know a period all that. of time. I, listen, and we no, know all that. Uh, so, but um, I want to focus on Vance I just want to say Vance something about second, J.D. Vance. I, I want to say this yeah, yeah. about J.D. Vance. I think turning the spigot on him full blast in the first day or two was a mistake. Oh, you think? I do. <laughs> and here's why. Here's why. Because... What else is there? In other words, I, if you want to hurt someone, you dribble it out. But everybody, the media were so excited to, to maybe drown him and think Trump would leave him without a lifeboat, and Trump's not going to do that. He's not going to do that any more than he's going to fire his campaign team, said the recommendation coming from people who don't like him and will never vote for him, and spent, spent years convincing us that behind the scenes, outside of public view, Joe Biden is some President Biden is somehow a trapeze artist triathlete. But so I'm glad he didn't. Trump's not the going to fire people. his campaign team. Uh, but I am curious, just like as a fun little social experiment here, just us girls. If Trump, <laughs> if Trump could go back in time, just a couple of months, because um, he makes the JD Vance pick when he is riding high and his team is openly talking to me and in the Atlantic about a blowout, 325 electoral votes. And it felt like at that point that the Vance pick was a luxury that they were making, that he was sort of choosing an heir apparent rather than a sort of governing partner and someone who could be additive to the ticket. If Trump knew that Biden was going to get out four days later, do you think he would pick someone else? No. He wanted Senator Vance really all along, um, kept going back to those last three finalists uh, and said that publicly. So I'm not saying anything that everybody didn't hear. Um, so no, I think he always wanted somebody who he thinks is willing to go into enemy territory, the lion's den on TV, because he had seen J.D. Vance on CNN, on MSNBC, on the three major networks, unafraid to talk about America First. He likes his life story. He likes, he likes those great academic credentials like Yale Law School, but he also loves that tale of the American dream. And you know, I worked on the opioid crisis in the White House with the president and the first lady. They broke the back of, uh, we had the first decline in overdose deaths in 29 years. And that's very near and dear to him. And he sees the story, he sees sort of the arc and knows other people can look at that. And, and I'll say this, um, I actually think 
the entire construct that you're asking me is really a question for Vice President Harris, as goes Governor Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania. I actually think that was a no-brainer. You stabilize the Jewish vote. Um, you show them that you're not just trying to mollify at all turns the 31 Democratic members of the House of Representatives who voted against a resolution on October 18th, 11 short days after the October 7th murders of 1,200 innocent Israelis. And it's the single they, state that will decide on, but the they election. Vote, but they voted against a resolution to condemn Hamas as a terrorist group. Basically, what our State Department has done under Republican and Democratic presidents. It wasn't a big, it was a layup. Yes. And you have 31 Democrats, two who have since lost their primaries. Um, with that as a big issue. 31 Democrats voting against that resolution. So she's got to deal a lot with, it's not just on college campuses, folks, it's in the halls of Congress, and it's scary stuff Killian. on any given day. But she has to deal with, I think, and then picking somebody who I think is better on school choice and charter schools than the average Democrat, Josh Shapiro, is better on fracking than the average Pennsylvania Democrat has been. Uh, I think that was a huge miss. But he can't wear a camouflage hat like Tim Walls can. There's... <laughs> Let me, we're, we're, we're running up against it. I want to ask you one other thing. Speaking of VPs, so long before you were involved with Donald Trump running for president, uh, Mike Pence was a longtime client of yours. And in fact, I've reported in my first book, also available on paperback, um, <laughs> that... Um, Buy one, get one free. Yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that you played probably the pivotal role in not only connecting Pence to Trump, but then persuading Trump that this was the right pick. And here we are, um, eight years later, and Donald Trump's former vice president is refusing to endorse him. What do you make of that? It's a, it's a free country. I and mean, Kamala Harris is saying she's not Joe Biden, the man that she's serving as, as his second in command. I think it's a little... Yeah, it's a little apple store. It's a little not nice. Um, so I think the Pence pick was the best pick. And the two runners up to that, um, Chris Christie and Newt Gingrich, you know, are friends of mine. And a Newt is a mentor of mine. But I didn't think that that was the right, uh, that it was the right winning formula for 2016. And they, and they stayed very close friends and advisors to President Trump all along. The Pence pick... <clears throat> work for lots of reasons that I still think is relevant, and I think it had a lot to do, and I, I kept watching um, the JD and, and, tr and Trump advisors talk about this before, during, and after the Vance pick, which is that you can bust into the upper Midwest and Rust Belt states. This was incredibly important in 2016 because I believed and said many times publicly that Hillary's blue wall was very real. That was a real thing. She started out with 264 electoral votes. You need 270 to win. That's scary stuff. And so the idea was you've got to pick a partner on the ticket who has credibility and reach there. So basically it could have been Governor Kasich of Ohio, Governor Pence of Indiana, Governor Walker of Wisconsin. But the thing about Mike Pence is he also, I think, mollified and gave a lot of comfort to and credibility to the evangelical Christians, yes. but also the, yes. the, also the constitutional conservatives, knowing that President Trump would be filling a lot of federal court vacancies, including definitely the Antonin Scalia and so seat. So the campaign strategy aside, though, is it... And he had been in the House. He had been the, I wanted to say that. Yes. Donald Trump said when he became nominee, the nominee, he said, you know, the one thing I don't really have experience in is Washington. I've never even spent a night there that I can remember. I don't have one. I want somebody with Washington experience. So Pence had had 12 years of Washington experience, but never became Washington, never became like this Washington insider. And he was sitting governor of Indiana. That is a, by the way, that is a relationship. I was there every day of, of that White House. That was a vice presidency and a vice presidency that worked for three years and two, uh, three years, 11 months and two weeks. And it worked very well, and they got a lot done. And I, I think that that was a, a great pairing until it didn't work. And I'm sorry the way that's until all gone down. Until it didn't work, yes. Until, until it didn't work. But, but, but and, so just to be clear on this, I mean, part of your explanation there for picking him in the first place was that he is a constitutional conservative. Is your read on this that um, in the president asking him to violate his oath to the Constitution on January 6th, that he no longer views Trump as fit for office? Because he has sort of danced around that precise explanation, but if you read his book and if you talk to people close to him, that's what he seems to believe. You have to ask him that. I think he's been on the record with this many, many times, and as have I. Uh, but uh, again, 
Kamala Harris, Tim Waltz, Tim Alberta, who's probably much more popular and would have been better on the ticket, um, is if you go back to what I call the greatest leftist hits, you're not engaging. You're not engaging. I'm t I'm pro I promise you, you're enraging people have already decided. These aren't the leftist hits. Mike voted. Pence is not the Hold leftist Hold on. No, 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 no. You're getting in there January 6th and this, that, and the other. Because I'm telling you, the last mile here, the 5% who are going to decide this election and say they are mostly economic voters, mostly, when they hear this, they feel like you're trying to enrage them and not engage them. They feel disrespected. And so that's, I think that's why this race is close. And I think that's why on some days, President Trump says, I've never had more people. I mean, 60,000 people RSVPing in Uniondale in Long Island on a, what was last night, Wednesday night, in a state that's, quote, blue. Uh, you, can't, you, you can't see that ever. And I, I went to Nassau Coliseum to see, took my son and my neighbor took her son um, a couple years ago to see the great Elton John perform, um, you know, there weren't people outside saying, gee, I couldn't get in. Donald Trump likes to say he, he packs more people into an arena than anybody who's never had a microphone or a piano or a guitar. And he does. And folks, you may say it doesn't matter. They're all the base. They're all the base. It does matter. People are showing up, but people are still afraid to say they're voting Trump. And that's the other thing I want to say. I coined that term in 2016, the undercover hidden Trump voter to international ridicule. Kellyanne, they'll still be hidden election day. Ha, ha, ha. They were real. They're more real now because they're more afraid now. They don't want every night to feel like Thanksgiving with the in-laws. They don't want to argue with people and their family and friends and coworkers. And some of them don't want to get a C when they've earned an A from that professor. We're some of them don't want to feel like they won't be promoted or hired because of their politics. Do you think there are hidden Kamala Harris voters in this country? Do you think so? Or do you think they're all out and about, very excited, peacocking? So that's the other big X factor here. It is difficult to get Trump voters to fully admit that they're supporting him. We are getting yelled at. So we're going to get out of here. And I want to thank you for your time. A quick yes or no question before I hold your applause. A quick yes or no this question. be another softball. Can you conceive of a scenario in which Trump loses and graciously concedes defeat? Yes. You can? Yes, of course you can. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and... And I really hope there's a third debate. I bet everybody here hopes there's a third debate. I do, I do hope there's another debate because um, we the people need to see they had never even met before. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump never been on the, in the same room before, apparently. I didn't even know that until I read that, we could let alone right the same here. stage. We could do it right here. right up here. But I'm all for it, and we'll see how that changes over time. Look, the stakes are really high. People in this country are suffering. A lot of people that Donald Trump said were forgotten men, forgotten women, forgotten children now feel invisible. And, and, I, and I think that, look, these issue sets, I, I'll leave you on this. We are a divided country politically, but we're also divided, we're also cleaved culturally. And I think this time, one, one area, one component I'm um, examining that really didn't exist before, we didn't talk about it before, is what I call the double, double gender gap. So the first job in polling I took, Frank once helped me get an $8 an hour job when I was 21, I'm 57, it's a long time ago, at the Worthland Group, that was Ronald Reagan's pollster at the end of the Reagan years. And um, Dr. Worthlin was one of the originators of the gender gap, trying to explain why, even though um, pre former, at the time, President Reagan beat Jimmy Carter, he lost among women. And then a one among certain women in 84 when it was a blowout and you had Geraldine Ferraro on the ticket, but lost among other women. And we've been studying it ever since. There are two gender gaps right now. Harris is doing much better among women Trump's doing much better among men. And that gender gap between male and female voters is exploding among our youngest voters. And that is something, you know, again, it's a free country, vote and think how you wish. I hope people do. But that is something I'm really keeping an eye on because it, it caught my attention just this morning in the new Fox News poll. Trump voters were asked, what are the most important issues to you in deciding your vote? And they said, um, economy and immigration, number one and number two in the 40s both. Harris voters were asked, What's the most important issue to you? Abortion, number one, and stopping the other side, number two. Usually, your voters are pretty much saying the same thing, but they like your policy more. We have entirely different kaleidoscopes through which we're even looking at these candidates and this election and what's at stake. So we have to be, I think, respectful of that. I don't think it's a great idea to call people irredeemable, deplorable, mega mag extremist. I, I agree with Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan. He says, I'm not a Trump guy, but he says don't insult the other people. I've heard, I, I heard Tim Waltz say that at some point. I hope he'll say it again. 
because that is the one thing. I mean, we just, um, I, I, ma'am, at least I show up. Uh, but anyway, and I put up and I stand up and I speak up, and that's my right. But the fact is that we have to find a way to be more respectful to each other. You may say, well, Trump said this. and like, I got it. Folks, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. As a mother of four teenagers, I think it's important to recognize that most people are not talking about this stuff. They're talking about what's vexing and perplexing them. And the more that people can hear them um, and respond to their very true, clear, and present needs, I think the better we'll do. But this double gender gap is really fascinating to me because, look, President Trump beat a woman before. He could beat a woman again as a majority of voters are female, just like they've been for every presidential election, Tim, since 1964. We decide who the presidents are. And it's a very different opponent this time. I think there are assets and liabilities that did not exist with Secretary Clinton. But the point I'm making is, how do you, I think abortion is a vote motivator and a turnout intensifier for the Democrats. And I think that on the Trump side of the ledger, people are coming out and saying, maybe I don't care for what he said, what he tweeted, this, that, and the other, but I, I want that economy back. That's no small thing to a growing slice in this country. And if all these polls are right, that he's getting anywhere from 20 to 24% of African-American black voters, he's getting over 40% of Hispanics, he, he doesn't need a majority of the following groups. If that happens, it, he's Union, going to win. But it's yes. a, that is an enormous if. Yes, it's an enormous if, but you know what? Both sides are running out of time. And we have already We're run running out, out of time. time. Thank you so much Thank for having me. Thank you, guys. Me. Great to see Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you.